good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're all very happy that you've all joined us today. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging is located and our work is done on unceded Indigenous lands. The Gani and Kahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojage, commonly known as Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many Indigenous peoples. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future, and our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples we serve within the Montreal community. Today's event is brought to you in collaboration with the Italian Canadian Community Services of Quebec. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MCS Stage Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of their needs to enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging, and finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Our presenters today are Margarita and Marzier. Margarita received a Bachelor's of Science in Human Nutrition from Universidad San Francisco de Quinto in Ecuador, which is where she was born and raised. Her undergraduate education focused on clinical and community nutrition, which led her to pursue a Master's in Dietetics at McGill University. Marzi is currently in her third year of undergrad as a dietetic student at McGill University as well, and she is very passionate about nutrition and its impact on different aspects of our health. Before continuing, we would like to remind you to mute your microphone on Zoom, and that if you have any questions, you can either write them down in the chat box on Zoom, or you could wait until the end of the event uh, to ask them out loud. I will bring your attention to the chat box. I'm sure we have some people writing in it already. I'll just put a little message hello, since we will be utilizing it throughout the event. Um, so just so you can get familiar and then I'll pass it off to our presenters to start the event. So I'm just going to share my screen. Perfect. Can everyone see? Is it all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kaylin. So hello, everyone. My name is Margarita. I'm one of the presenters today, and I'm here with my partner, Marcy. Hi, I'm Marcy. Okay. So first, let me thank you for attending today's presentation, which is on the topic, Cooking for One Has Never Tasted So Delicious. So I hope you enjoyed this workshop and you get some tips out of it that will help you to make cooking for one more enjoyable, easy, and will hopefully help you to save some money. So in today's workshop, we will discuss the joys of cooking as well as the challenges. And then we will move on to some strategies to minimize the challenges of cooking for one, which includes meal planning and smart shopping. So to start, I would like to hear from you. What do you think are the joys or the benefits of cooking for one or just cooking in general? I can start us if you guys want to still like yeah. take some time. Yeah. So course. personally, I like cooking for myself because I know that I'm going to be the only one eating it. So I can just try different ingredients, different flavors, maybe add different vegetables, different sources of protein. And knowing that it would only be me who eats it, I could just be creative. So does anyone else wants to share anything? I my when I do a cooking for one or two or three, whatever, it relaxes me. I yeah. find that I calm down, you know. Yeah, I completely agree. Yes. Someone else? In the chat box, someone says it's fun to try new recipes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh, it's Caitlin. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Thank you so much for participating. It's so nice to see that some of you uh, think that there are so many good things about cooking for one. So I think this slide summarizes some of the ideas um, you guys came up with and some of the benefits of cooking in general. So cooking for one person can promote your health because you have control over the ingredients and over the portions that you cook for yourself. 
And you can also personalize your meals according to your dietary needs and your preferences. It can also save you some money because eating out nowadays is more expensive. And another benefit uh, of cooking for wine is that the chances that you get to appreciate your food, the foods um, that you eat are greater because you are part of the whole cooking process from start to end. And when you cook and you sit down to a plate of food that you have prepared for yourself, chances are that you will eat more mindfully, um, noticing each flavor and component of your meal. Also, um, by cooking, you can preserve and reconnect with your family food traditions. Also, cooking can uh, help us to learn a new skill, for example, learn about cuisines and cooking techniques from other countries. And we can continue to preserve our cognitive skills, for example, math skills by counting, measuring, and following recipe directions. Finally, it encourages creativity because you can experiment with different versions of your favorite recipe, and you can create both happy kitchen experiments and memories, which in turn can help you to build confidence and increase your self-esteem. So as you see, cooking has many benefits um, that contribute to health as well as your well-being. However, there are some challenges of cooking for one that Marcy will walk us through. So before we move on, I would like to hear from you guys. So what are some challenges that you face when you're cooking for one? It's difficult to buy small quantities. Sometimes you get the big quantities of food and then you just either waste it or keep it for another occasion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great challenge to face when you're cooking for one. Yes, absolutely. Oh, waste. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else wants to? Yeah, portion sizes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I, I can also participate. <laughs> Uh, well, sometimes I don't feel like cooking because I'm very busy with school or I'm feeling just too tired. So I prefer spending um, the energy that I have left in something else other than cooking. Yeah, exactly. I can totally relate. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone says cutting down recipes to make one portion. Exactly. Yeah, that is also one challenge. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. So those are all great points that you mentioned. But here we have some other points, as well as the points that you mentioned. So um, one challenge could be that buying for one can be more expensive and than buying in bulk sometimes. But then there might also be leftovers, as you said. So regardless of how much you buy, there might still be a lot of breath leftovers. And there's the perishable items can also go bad before we can even use them in a recipe. But also cooking takes time and not everyone might have the free time to cook every single day. And the last point I wanted to mention was the fact that uh, about motivation. So cooking for one is not always enjoyable because you're alone and you want to you're the only one eating it in the end. Yeah. And someone says dishes and mess seems not worth it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Totally. There's so many challenges. So even though these are some challenges and um, like, of course, we talked about some challenges, but there are also some things that we could do to help overcome those challenges. So one of these tips is meal planning. Meal planning is when you decide what you would be eating throughout the following week, considering your schedule, food preferences, budget, items on sale, etc. While meal prepping, which you may have heard of it, is actually preparing the dishes that you're going to have throughout the following week. So this works best for those on a tight schedule. And of course, if you don't mind not having that much variety in your meals, because you might be having similar or the same meal every day. So wait, based on what we discussed, what do you think are some benefits of meal planning? Anyone has an idea? less waste because you plan what you use. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. You're planning everything ahead of time. So you can manage for the waste as well. 
Yeah, no one else? Time saving for cooking later in the week? Exactly, yes. yes. Perfect, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you for participating. You guys are awesome. <laughs> so, um, the first thing you want to consider before we actually start meal planning is um, your budget. So, what you want to do is before we get into details of meal planning, uh, you want to include. You want to um, review your weekly budget for food. You want to check what is on sale, and you want to compare the prices for items between and within different stores. So, um, also another point to think about is the prices that are going up right now. So, in 2022, it's predicted that we have a five to seven percent rise in food prices. And we already see the gas price going up as well. So these are all the budgetary stuff that you want to consider before you man before you want to do the meal planning and preparing what you want to like the plan that you want to be following for the following week. So now knowing that not only the food prices have been going up, but also the gas price keeps going up and it makes it harder to go shopping as often or as far away as before. Uh, I would like to ask you, considering all these challenges, how do you go about budgeting your food and doing your grocery shopping? Like, do you use coupons, flyers, price matching maybe, maybe go walking to the nearby store or even driving to the nearby store? Is there any strategies that you have? Price matching apps? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Perfect. Yes. That's a great idea. Well, I look at all the flyers and as Caitlin says, compare the prices and go to the grocery store, which has the cheapest and the best one I want. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Perfect. That's a great point. Yeah, flyers, watching for sales and flyers. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Those are all great. Thank you. Thank you. So as we mentioned, budget is one of the uh, frozen vegetables and meat. Of course. Yes, totally. So budget is one of the challenges when it comes to cooking for one, but when you're planning your meals, you can buy your food items according to the grocery deals, coupons, different prices for the same items, etc. the things that we mentioned. So this way you can manage how much you're spending in that week for your groceries. So knowing that the prices are going up and um, that is not only for the groceries, but also for the gas. Then this makes us consider that we may not want to go grocery shopping as often as before, or we might prefer the stores that are closer to our place so that we're not using too much gas and we're not spending our money only on gas, you know? So there, these are all things to consider when thinking about your food budget. Now, there are some useful apps and websites to help you check the weekly grocery flyers if you don't have access to the printed ones. For example, here we have a website called Circulars, which Margarita will um, send you guys the link um, in the chat box. So there you can find the grocery stores that you like and check the prices for the items that you want to purchase. And that way you could compare online and uh, you don't need to like have the printed version of pliers. Now, another tip is to try to buy more seasonal foods. So. The reason is because when a food is in season, it would be cheaper. So uh, if you want to be aware of the seasonal food items in Quebec, you can check Equitaire. That is also a PDF file that we're going to send you a link again. So thank you, Margarita, by the way. So um, you can always look at the months on top of the page, and then you're going to see the seasonal fruits and vegetables for that month. So let's say, for example, and we're in April, look at, we're going to look at April and then we're going to look at what fruits and vegetables are in season. We see apples, beets, cabbage, for example. So we know that if um, we want to buy these right now, they're, they should be cheaper compared to some other months. Like, for example, celery, April would be more cheaper compared to June. So that just gives you a general idea. And then when you want to go to actually grocery shopping, you can find the items at the grocery store. You can find it at community gar gardens and even farmers markets, especially if you would like to support your local farmers. That would be a great idea. So now that we have the general idea in mind, we can move on to the steps of meal planning. 
the first step would be to investigate your fridge and freezer. So you want to consider what you already have available. You want to look at the expiry dates of items. You want to look at the perishable items because those would be your priorities to use them in a recipe. So basically you're thinking, what do I have and what do I need? This step is really simple. And then you want to plan your meal. So you want to choose a time in the week where you could actually sit down and think about your following week and you want to plan your meal. You want to write down meal ideas. You want to find some recipes and decide what you want to have for breakfast, lunch and supper of each day of the week. Now, I know that sometimes finding recipes could be challenging because we don't always, we can't always come up with like every recipe and it's sometimes tiring to always keep thinking, oh, what should I make now? What should I eat? So does anyone have any suggestions for where they can find more recipes? I have a book where I've kept all my old recipes. Sometimes I go through them, but it becomes very boring. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great right? new recipes. That's a great idea. A book that that's good. Uh, someone said Google. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So there are different ways that you can find more recipes, either online or in cookbooks. Yeah, cookbooks and net. Yeah, exactly. So some online resources for you to search for some recipes are websites that are made by dietitians. So we have some examples here, such as SOS Cuisine, Meal Lime, Canada's Food Guide, Cookspiration, which is the picture that we put here, Unlock Food, and of course, cookbooks. If you have any on hand, that would be a great idea. So some websites allow you to change the number of servings. So because you know that some recipes, they call for four or eight servings. And if you're only cooking for one or two people, you might want to change the serving size before you're going to end up with a lot of leftovers. So some websites allow you to do that on the website. You can just click portion and like you, you go for one. If not, just make sure that you scale it down manually so that you're not cooking for eight people when you're only one person eating the food at the end. Now let's do a small activity. So while you're going through what you have and what you need and deciding your recipes, you also want to clean out your fridge. So you want to either use the little leftovers that you have in a recipe or you want to freeze them for later. Like let's say if you have too much bread and you don't know what to do with it, you can just freeze it for now rather than, or you can make a recipe with it if, if you can make a recipe now. So that allows you to just clean your fridge and freezer before you buy new items and add on to that. So now let's do this activity. Let's say you have less like some leftover corn. You have some leftover lentils, some chicken, carrots and some chicken broth. What could you do with these? You could either add them all, like uh, put them all in one recipe. You can do different recipes and freeze the rest, anything. What would you guys do? I would make a soup. Perfect. That's what I would do too. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy and you're using all of them. It's an easy way to incorporate all of them. Perfect. Anyone else? I would probably make a pasta salad with all the ingredients. I would probably freeze the, the chicken broth for next time and add some extra vegetables. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great idea. And someone also said soup or broth for other recipes. Exactly. Yes, that would be a great idea. Yeah, so some ideas that we came up with when we were making this was the soup, of course, that's the, I think, the ideal. <laughs> and you could also make patties. You can make a dip with the lentils, like hummus kind of thing, if you'd like. Or you could just uh, make corn patties or make patties with all of them. Well, without the vegetable broth and you can always freeze the vegetable broth for later. So great, great activity. Thank you. So Margarita and I decided to make a dark chocolate Greek yogurt dip using our perishable food items and some leftover Greek yogurt. So it was a very delicious and easy recipe to make and it tasted great, honestly. You should really try this. <laughs> so all you need would be half a cup Greek yogurt, two tablespoon cocoa powder, three tablespoon maple syrup, 
half teaspoon vanilla extract, half teaspoon cinnamon, and a cup of berries. So it's a very easy recipe and you can always, um, like we use berries, but you could always try it with different fruits if you'd like. And this way you're getting your fruits as well in the day. Yeah, and I find the maple syrup goes very well with the Greek yogurt dips. But if you don't have any at home, you can always replace it uh, with honey. Or for example, if your doctor or dietitian have recommended you to reduce your intake of other sugar, um, you can replace it with your favorite artificial sweetener. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very flexible um, recipe and it's really easy, honestly. So we're going to get to the video of us actually making it. So this is Margarita making it. She's first adding the Greek yogurt. One of the reasons why we chose Greek yogurt was because of it. it's a great source of protein. And then she's going to add the coca powder. So if you're not a big fan of coca, coca powder, you can also try it with peanut butter. That goes well with the Greek yogurt as well or anything else that you've already tried and you know you're going to like with Greek yogurt. And then maple syrup, vanilla and cinnamon and she's going to mix them all. Yeah. And for this recipe, we use a uh, uh, Greek yogurt because it's much uh, thicker and creamy than uh, other regular yogurts. And it gives the deep, uh, smooth as consistency. But if you are not a fan of Greek yogurt, you can always switch the brand or uh, switch uh, this Greek yogurt for any regular plain yogurt. Yeah, we really enjoyed this recipe. It was so good and easy to make. And my favorite part was the consistency, but of course the chocolate. <laughs> yeah, the smell of the chocolate is very good, very good. Also, something that I, I really like about this recipe is that it's really, well, other than the fact that it's really easy to make, but it's a very kids-friendly recipe, especially like if, if you're making, um, like if you have family over or you, you have kids over, it's a very easy thing to um, make for them. And uh, especially for kids who have a little like difficulties eating fruits, this way they, they might be actually enjoying their fruits more. And it's very easy for you as well. So um, do you have any comments or suggestions for the recipe? Would you try it at home or is there anything that you would like to modify? No comments. Looks great. Thank you. <laughs> it does. Uh, you should try it. <laughs> oh my God, no. Wait. Okay, good. So. Here's the nutrition facts table that we made for uh, three quarters of cup of dark chocolate Greek yogurt with one cup of berries. So that's why like the calories and like all these numbers are a little high, but it's a great source of protein because of the Greek yogurt, as we mentioned, and the vitamins and mineral contents of, and of course the calories, they will change depending on what fruits you're adding to it. So we went for berries and you see how vitamin C it's 70%. So that's a lot that's great but if you go maybe i think i would try it with bananas as well or um, maybe like pineapples mangoes anything or grapes even and the vitamin and mineral content should change but it would still be a great source of protein great way to get your um like fruits and yeah that's great so also the cost per portion for the dip only was around two dollars and 13 cents so we checked to see if you were to buy it like elsewhere elsewhere like in the store how much it would be but we couldn't find a dark chocolate greek yogurt dip we found dark chocolate dip or greek yogurt dip and they were all above four dollars so here you're saving a lot of money by like almost um, the price is double if you were to buy it at the store by making it at home yeah and you will also save some time because it takes just I believe five to seven minutes to make and you don't even have to go to the grocery store because those are ingredients that we usually have at home. Yeah, exactly. Great point. 
Perfect. So the next step in meal planning is now that we took care of our fridge, <laughs> the next step would be meal uh, would be um, making a grocery list. So you want to consider the ingredients that you do not have and you want to consider the little snacks that you can just have like grab and go. And of course, you want to use the flyers, as we said, to help you decide where to buy which item. Then with that list, you want to go to the grocery store and do your shopping. So now, Margarita will talk about how to do smart shopping. Thank you. So yes, Mercy gave us a very nice summary of tips that we should probably be doing before going to the grocery store. But in this part of the presentation, we will talk about how to shop smarter and how to reduce food waste. So first, we will touch on bulk buying, but before we get into the details, I want to mention that bulk buying doesn't necessarily mean going to Costco or buy all your foods and supplies in bulk. This, on the opposite, means that you will buy the larger option of food products that you use um, regularly at your local grocery store and saving money compared to buying the smaller um compared to buying the smaller uh, portions. So for example, you can buy this bag of three peppers instead of buying individual peppers. Um, you can buy the two kilogram bag of rice instead of um, buying the smaller option. Or you can buy the one kilogram pack of ground beef rather than the 450 grams uh, option. So as I mentioned, um, you can do a bulk buying at your local grocery store, but also in some other places. For example, a, you can visit your local a butcher shop, local farmer's markets, and also bulk bar. So is there anyone here who buys their food in bulk and why or why not? I can participate here. So sometimes I do bulk buying because it's environmentally friendly and because you're using less individual packaging and also because especially like when I have exams and I'm really busy with, mm -hmm. um, you know, other stuff and I don't have the time to go grocery shopping once a week or something like that. Um, I would just go to Costco, let's say once, and mm -hmm. then I just have everything, especially for meats, chicken, those things where I can freeze. That for me, that would be a good option on those cases. So it's environmentally friendly and you say you save some time? Save time. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. I, I would buy bulk food, some of the food, not everything. Yeah. Fresh vegetables you can't buy in bulk. Mm -hmm. You can buy flour, you can buy milk, two, two, two jugs for milk, or two packets of margarine, or two packets of flour or something like that but not for fresh vegetables. Okay, so like dry goods, baking products. Yeah, and even something yeah. which you could freeze. If I can mm -hmm. buy two chicken and freeze one, that's another yeah. story. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, those yeah, are great. Yes. Limited storage. Sorry, yeah. I was just reading the chat. Yeah. I know. That's, my point. that's not that much space in everybody's house, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I have a, a particular pet peeve about that, uh, especially with the grocery stores now. Frequently, if you buy two, it's cheaper on a per basis than one. Right. And I find that I, I feel that it it uh, discriminates against single people, but even more so against the poor and the elderly who may not have the space for it, who may mm -hmm. not have the freezer for it um, and end up paying more. The, mm -hmm. the ones that are most vulnerable end up paying more because they can only buy a small package or only get one. Yeah. Um, and I agree with Dolly. I mean, something like uh, a meat that I'm not, that I don't eat very frequently. I don't want to buy a large package. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I, I end up paying more for the smaller package just because um, it's, it is perishable and, and ends up in the freezer and ends up at the back or the bottom. And, and it just ends up get going, getting wasted anyway. But yeah. I do have a pet peeve about the, the grocery stores because I think it discriminates. Okay. Thank you for participating. And yes, uh, bulk buying is not, is definitely not the best option for everyone. And no, like, uh, for so many options that we will discuss right now. And of course, uh, bulk buying is a good option for some products, but not for all of them, 
especially when it comes to dry goods, for example, is a good option. But for perishable products, maybe it's not, especially for those that are living alone, including me, maybe uh, it's not the best. Okay. So yes, I want to discuss bulk buying with you because it's a good strategy to save money on the long term, but it is possible that it's not the best strategy for everyone. So overall, bulk buying would work best for you if it's an ingredient that you cook regularly and you enjoy buying, as you mentioned. Um, you also have a good system like meal planning in place for using what you have already purchased before it spoils or to avoid um, a food waste or to avoid having too many leftovers. And also it's adequate if you have a, an adequate storage space. So before you go to your local grocery store or once you are already there, you want to make sure that the a product in bulk is a better deal compared to the smaller option, right? So there are two steps to do this. First, you need to calculate the unit prices of the products, meaning that the bulk, uh, meaning the bulk option and the smaller option, and then you compare those prices. So you are probably already familiarized with this equation, but just as a quick reminder, um, you calculate the unit price uh, by uh, dividing the total price of the product by the weight or number of units. So in this case, um, the example is ground beef. So uh, you will use weight. So on the left, you have the bulk option for, the, for ground beef where you are paying 0 0.011 cents per gram of ground beef. And on the right, you have the smaller option for which you will be paying 0 0.014 cents per gram. So apparently it's just a few cents but if you decide to buy the one kilogram of ground beef in bulk, you are saving $3 that you could use to buy something else. For example, you could buy seven gala apples at Walmart. So again, um, never forget to check the unit prices first because it's possible that sometimes the smaller options, uh, the smaller the size options are better deal. For example, when it's on sale, or it's on sale with a coupon, which could make them have a lower unit price than the bulk version. And in that case, you might uh, want for sure um, go for the smaller option. So now let's pretend that you have already bought the food that you regularly use either in bulk or either in a small option. So how do you take advantage of those foods? How do you use them so that you don't waste uh, a food and you don't have too many leftovers. Someone already made, mentioned maybe find a friend to share with that. I think that goes with this question as well. That's mm -hmm. a great mm -hmm. tip. Yeah, that's a great strategy. Yeah, I would also say that's, the same thing. You want to have something else. Yeah, just forget about the bulk product or the small option. Like what do you do in general just to avoid food waste? Mm -hmm. don't don't overheat it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah food safety yes freeze extra portions goes back to meal planning yeah definitely yeah if you know you're buying something that there mm -hmm. will be leftovers plan yeah. to use it in another meal exactly perfect that's a great and idea that's what i mentioned before that sometimes if you don't have a good system in place to avoid food waste maybe bulk buying is not the best option for you yeah. okay so there are some strategies that we'll be uh, discussing right now and that depending on your preferences and needs, you can either use one or the other or a combination of all of them. So first we have freezing your foods. And for this, we have three different options. We can freeze the, uh, the foods as uh, it is, like just like you see in the first picture, the ground beef. Of course, for those um, living alone, including me, it's always better, better to the buy, for example, the ground beef into small portions, and then you freeze it. 
And then uh, you will be uh, using that small portion whenever you have planned to make a recipe that calls for ground beef. And you have planned for this in previous steps, which is uh, a Marcy talk about uh, meal planning. So you have already planned for that. Then um, you also have the option to cook your ingredient first, then divide it into portions and freeze it. And I think this is also um, a great idea when you are, for example, looking to save some time because you have already cooked the meat in advance. And then you have the option to use your ground beef to make a meal, for example, chili, and you can divide it into small portions and then freeze it. And in this way, you will have chili on hand or your favorite recipe on hand for whenever you feel like eating it. So of these uh, three options, which one do you guys um, use more frequently? Or do you like the most? Or is better if it's better your needs? <clears throat> oh, what? <laughs> You Marcy, you go. Yeah. So I think for me, it really depends on like if I just bought it and like I have time that day, I might um, cook it either like um, partially or make a meal and then I would freeze it. But if I don't have time on that day, I'll just freeze it raw. And then someday when I have time, I will like cook it mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. So, so instead of divide into portions, I usually freeze fully cooked, cook yeah, and then cook portion. And then portion. Yeah. Yeah. It really depends. Sometimes time, if we want to save time, we'll for sure cook and then freeze. But if we feel like having a fresh meal and we do have time, maybe we just uh, freeze it and then cook it. Cook recipe and freeze individually. Yes. Thank you so much for participating. Those are great ideas. So, um, so then uh, we have another strategy, which is to repurpose your ingredients. And this basically means reusing, for example, that frozen cooked chicken that you cook and froze uh, last week or reusing chicken leftovers from yesterday's dinner. So here on your left, you see that um, uh, we came up with three easy and quick recipes that you can make, um, you, can, you, you can do to use that shredded chicken that you probably cooked last week. And so we decided to, to maybe, um, you can decide to maybe do a chicken salad sandwich or a recipes with chicken and couscous or chicken tacos. And another example will be to repurpose tomato sauce, homemade tomato sauce. So do you have any recipes in mind where we can use these homemade tomato sauce? <laughs> some Persian Iranian recipes, but I can't get the name out just right now. They use all this. Sorry? There are some Iranian recipes uh -huh. where you can use all this, but I don't remember the names of them. Oh, the names? Okay, the tomato sauce? Yeah, and oh, the okay. chicken and couscous and all that. You know. Okay, that's great. I will probably Google them. That's great. Someone says pasta, eggplant, mm -hmm. spaghetti, oh, tomato soup, this one. Tomato soup. Tomato soup. Yeah. chicken, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, those are great ideas. We also came up with a, three different ideas. So chili, lasagna, and stuffed peppers. So which are uh, obviously good recipes too to um, use the homemade tomato sauce. So if you see um, here in these pictures, um, recipes like the lasagna are usually made to get a more than one serving. So in that case, you may want to consider saving your leftovers for another day or making a different recipe that is easier to scale down to one serving. So what do you do with the leftovers? Like if you guys, for example, do lasagna, or chili, uh, you probably do this for uh, your family, your friends, or for yourself, but not just one serving. So what do you do with the, with the leftovers? Mm -hmm. Great. Freeze them. Freeze them, yeah. 
Yeah. If you are not going to eat them like right away or the next day, probably yeah. them is the best option. Yeah, definitely. The freezer is our best friend. <laughs> okay. So some tips um, just to freeze them. So you will divide them into portions and store them in a clean container. I'm, I'm sure you, you are doing this. And then you will make sure that you label and date the leftovers to help identify the contents and to ensure that they are not stored too long. So generally, you can eat uh, refrigerated leftovers within two to three days, or you can freeze them for later use. So on your right, you can see that some foods may uh, preserve longer than others. So for example, uh, poultry and fish will last between three to four days in the fridge or in the freezer for up to six months. And then um, the opposite, you see that whole soups are are good for two to three days and then in the freezer uh, for up to uh, four months. And then we will also be, uh, I think Marcy will send you these uh, food safety guidelines. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Marcy. Yeah. So, and the last tip um, that we will discuss today is um, uh, to make to make use good use of your groceries and avoid waste is to buy your food products with your family and friends. So, for example, you can buy perishable items or meat in bulk and then split the cost. And in this way, you also make sure that you are not wasting food. They can uh, you can also um, save some money because you are splitting the cost uh, and. This can also be a fan bonding experience. You can also cook large batches of meal with them or with your community and share. Or you could also take turns to buy the groceries and then uh, to deliver them to each other. So now um, we will show you a video of this amazing <laughs> Primavera couscous recipe where we repurpose a shredded cooked chicken press. So the ingredients for one serving uh, were one cup of shredded uh, cooked chicken breast, one third of a cup of couscous, one third of a cup of chicken broth, one quarter diced onion, one chopped Greek onion, one quarter diced uh, red bell pepper, uh, one um, garlic, a garlic clove, and the spices that we added were paprika, cumin, turmeric, and salt and pepper to taste. So now let's watch the video. And just as a quick reminder, never forget to wash your hands before you start cooking. And also uh, don't forget to wash your vegetables. So to start, we heat the oil in a medium pan over a medium heat. And then you will add the chicken, it's already cooked, as you see, the spices and the salt and the pepper. So for the chicken, you can even go for other protein sources like fish, shrimp, or even tofu. And same for the spices, you can adjust them according to your preferences, whatever that you like most. Mm -hmm. So you will cook this for about five minutes since the chicken is already cooked. And then you will um, remove this from heat and set aside. Then heat the rest of the oil and add the onions, bell pepper, and garlic. So actually this step is where you, you see a lot of colors and of course a lot of fiber. And you can even add other vegetables that you have on hand to have more fiber. Like if, if I were making it, I would have added some mushrooms maybe, any, any like uh, vegetables that you have on hand. Mm -hmm. And stir fry for about five minutes. And towards the end of the five minutes, you stir in the green onions. You will also add the chicken broth and bring these to a boil. It smells really good. In this stage, it, the smell is perfect, honestly. Yeah, Even all the combination of vegetables. Yeah. Then you add um, the couscous. Stir briefly 
and you were you will uh, cover immediately. So here we use the regular couscous, but we suggest that you use whole wheat so that you get even more fiber in your recipe. And let it seal uh, for about five to six minutes. And after that, you will stir in the chicken and serve uh, this amazing couscous with your favorite salad. Mm -hmm. And when you add the chicken, it smells even more because of the, like, uh, it smells really good because of the spices and it tastes amazing. You should really try. And again, this one as well, it's very flexible. You could add more vegetables. You can add, mm, like, you can change the ingredients a little as you wish. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So what do you think about this recipe? Do you have any comments? There is something that you would have done differently? No, <laughs> I would personally have added some lime juice because I just like everything sour. So that would be something I would do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If anyone else has mm -hmm. any tips for us, yeah. maybe next time we try it, we could uh, do something differently. Yeah, I, I, I love couscous, so I make a lot of couscous, but I use it as a side dish with, say, cutlets or another gravy dish. As, as something like a mashed potato, I use a substitute and instead of mashed potato, I would use couscous. Instead of rice, I would use couscous. You know? Yes, yes, oh, definitely. Okay. As your a uh, serving of grains, yes. It, I never, I, I've never used it as a salad. As a salad. I'll try it now. So you eat the couscous with some with something protein, else. with something else. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, I've never <laughs> tried that. I should try it. It's so easy to make that couscous. Yeah. Oh, uh, I see in the chat. Uh, yeah. Someone says very side uh, dishes. It's easy, nice as a leftovers, and goes well with uh, most dishes, meat, fish. That yeah, it goes very well with everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. So okay. So this was the cost for a portion, four dollars with sixty cents. And this recipe is a great source of protein as well as fiber and other environments. And of course, if you decide to use um, whole wheat couscous, that will be a greater source of fiber for you. So here, this is just a summary of everything that we talked about. So we started by talking about some challenges, which a lot of you participated. Thank you so much. And um, the tips that we mentioned were uh, are here, such as meal planning, smart shopping, repurposing ingredients, shopping and cooking with a friend or family member. So we see that in terms of price and time, all these tips can help for both of them. And the tips that were mainly like really helped with every single challenge were meal planning and repurposing ingredients. So this is just a general idea of everything that we covered today. And thank you so much for attending and thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, next week you can also join us. We'll, we'll have another nice topic, tips and tricks for all day energy.